Hey, let's have some fun. Let's look at a list of prominent goddesses from Greek and Roman mythology through two different lenses. One, the lens of the psychological theory of myth, and two, the lens of the New Age movement. Why? Because when we look at these ancient goddesses through these two lenses, they're gonna really open up in a powerful, potent way. We're gonna see Joseph Campbell's pedagogical function of myth really come alive as we just sort of toy with some rich questions around what do, what do the temperaments and personalities and stories and qualities and characteristics of these goddesses have to teach me about how to be a better version of myself? Because yes, this video is not just for the ladies. We are looking at everybody here because in the anima, animus, male, female qualities, this gradient scale of characteristics, sensibilities, activities that we all embody. You know, we're all yin and yang in combination. So this isn't just for women. Um, I think as we get into some of these goddesses, guys, you'll see what I mean. There's a lot of rich connectivity across gender normative boundaries. So like I said, let's have some fun with this. So what is the psychological theory of myth? It's pretty straight for, straightforward. It's, 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 it's the idea that mythology comes from an, a deep well of investigation into the psyche, into who we are mentally, our behaviors, our memory, our consciousness, our strengths, our weaknesses, our fears, what we call the mind, may just be the well out of which mythology comes. You know, we thought about the collective unconscious. In fact, thinking about Jung, it's, 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 really, it's really from Jung and, and his counterpart, Freud, that this deep connection comes. The, link, the links between psychology and mythology were really immediately established at the dawn of psychology by its prominent patriarchs, people like Jung and Freud and William James, you know, about a hundred years ago, that's how young psychology is in the Western tradition. And, you know, things, Freud reached back into Greek mythology to the Greek tragedy of Oedipus Rex um, for his Oedipal com complex, you know, this crazy Freudian idea that every son wants to, you know, be with his mother and kill his father. So uh, Jung, too, reached back into classical sources, anima, animus. Look, a lot of these sort of European intellectuals for centuries grew up steeped in a rich education in the classics, in Greek and Roman philosophy, mythology, and history, and literature. And so those names and stories just pop up all the time. I mean, just try reading Nietzsche, right? The German philosopher Nietzsche. You can't go three pages without him referencing some classical uh, play or uh, some tragic story. So um, the idea of narcissism, right? A word a lot of us kind of think a lot about these days. Narcissist, a story we'll get to later in this course. So... Clearly, there's a link between psychology and mythology just in that sense alone. But to put a finer point on it, the psychological theory of myth is the idea that mythology is itself an externalization of internal psychological realities. So look inside yourself. We see a cluster of different energy systems sometimes in conflict with each other, as Joseph Campbell puts it. This organ wants that, and this organ wants this, and sometimes they go at it. You know, the head wants this, and the heart wants another, and so on. So the conflicts we experience within ourselves, between the energy systems within us, um, that, the psychological theory of myth claims, gets externalized into uh, personified characters around us. I mean, just l look inside who you are and it's all right there. You perceive within yourself um, moments of beautiful selfless compassion and infinite mercy. 
And there's parts of you that are fiercely protective of the ones that you love. And you sometimes uncover a well within you of, of indefatigable creativity. Uh, and there's part of you that has endless cleverness at crafting order out of chaos. And there is also within you icy indifference, petulant malice, um, shocking and out of nowhere surprising violent impulses. Um, we all have that part of us, don't we, of, of cruel self-absorption and rapacious lust. So we recognize all these devils and angels within us, and, and the psychological theory of myth says, you know, it's kind of an interesting way of analyzing myth to say that we simply externalize and personify all of that. That's what all the gods and the devils are. That's what all the angels and the demons are. They are the bits and pieces of us that were in conflict that we externalized and personified in some kind of ancient way of through narrative, through art, through storytelling to kind of cope with, work through, and I don't know, maybe even make sense out of the sometimes dramatic conflict between these warring energy sources within us. So look, it's just an analytical tool. Don't want to be dogmatic about this and reduce all mythology to this one explanation. But I tell you what, I, I think it's a pretty live way of approaching a lot of these stories, that all the heavens are within us, as Joseph Campbell says, all the hells are within us, all the gods are within us, and all the demons are within us. So with that in mind, Let's see if we can uh, learn something about ourselves, about our psyches, by looking at the personalities and temperaments of, of seven. I've picked seven of the more prominent Greek and Roman goddesses. Now, the New Age element I referenced at the beginning of our video today, you know, something happened in the 20th century, really in the last 50 years, that we sometimes call the New Age movement. And you know, go ahead and make fun of it if you like. There's a lot of maybe silliness in it in some circles, certainly. But it's also kind of an, a, a wonderfully open-hearted, open-minded willingness to re-examine a lot of the ancient wisdom traditions that kind of got pushed to the side by mainstream religion. Some of the, you know, the lost mystery teachings and, and all this cool, obscure stuff. And, and looking at some of those ancient wisdom teachings in a new light and integrating it with the human potential movement and psychology and what we're learning about the brain and physiologically. And so it's just a kind of new way of thinking about old wisdom teachings. And the goddess has become very prominent. Look, I know I'm competing with a lot of videos on YouTube called uh, The Goddess Within or The Great Goddess or whatever, finding the goddess in you and all that stuff. And, and no disrespect to all those teachers. You know, there's a lot of amazing people doing a lot of amazing things. Hopefully the take I'm going to take on it today is useful to some of you as well. So let's just look at some of these seven goddesses and see if Again, Campbell's pedagogical function swings into view. Let's start with Aphrodite. So Aphrodite, as you recall, was born from the foam, from the severed genitalia of Uranus when his son Kronos, at his mother Gaia's behest, brought out the Sith and castrated his father and his bloody genitals fell into the sea. I know, Greek myth, right? They go, they just get right at it. Um, out of the foam rose this beautiful goddess called Aphrodite. Again, in later Roman mythology, her name becomes Venus. So maybe we've all seen the Botticelli painting, Venus on the half shell. She's nude, kind of like floating in on a shell up to the beach. So this is, a, this is an archetypal goddess portrait, Aphrodite. We'll use the Greek name. She's the goddess of love and sensuality and beauty and she represents the power of seduction, attraction. She represents the power of gentleness over brute strength. She's she's in a very I, I'm I'm skittering towards the toward, toward the edge of a kind of sexist remark here, but she's that sort of 
hyper feminine, prototypical, you know, um, glamorous female that you sometimes see images of in our culture, you know, the flowing skirts and hyper -fem femininity and a kind of in a kind of cartoonish excess even. And so she also represents a kind of unabashed comfort with her body, with sex, with pleasure. Um, you know, she's the first one to take off her clothes and go skinny dipping at the, at, the, at the swimming hole. She doesn't care, you know, she's like, naked people are beautiful. <laughs> Is she wrong? You know, so she celebrates self-love and self-acceptance and pampering and enjoyment. So here's how Aphrodite represents part of us. You know, when, when we lose ourselves in ecstasy, when we lose ourselves in sensual indulgence, we are embodying Aphrodite. She's a remarkable figure. And it's, it's challenging to think of that as a kind of power, right? We think of Aphrodite working at the makeup counter at Nordstrom's, um, shopping too much, maybe. Interested in all of the finer, more beautiful things. But let's see if there's a place for her in this goddess pantheon that we're about to construct of a kind of, of one of the facets of not only female power, but human power, the ability to celebrate beauty, sensitivity, gentleness, feeling, sensuality, ecstasy. The second goddess I want to look at with you is Artemis. Now, she's probably more well-known by her Roman, her later Roman name, Diana. So there's a lot of Dianes and a lot of Dianas out there for sure. So she is the goddess of the hunt, of, of wildlife, of independence. She's kind of in some ways the opposite of Aphrodite. She, by the way, she's the twin of Apollo. So there's that. They both have Zeus for a father. So Artemis, let's go with that name or Diana if you prefer. She's quite the contrast with Aphrodite. Um, Aphrodite's at the mall and Artemis is, uh, you know, out hiking a mountain trail all by herself with her bow and arrow. Um, Aphrodite's getting ready for the party um, where she's going to seduce some people. And Artemis is not interested in seeing anybody today. She's off on her own. She's, she's independent. And uh, Artemis never married. She is self-defined. She doesn't need a relationship to define her. She's complete. She's untamed. She's untamable. <laughs> she's a free spirit and athletic, right? She gets her identity from physical exertion, from mastery. She's friends with all the animals, as well as the killer of some of them. So who is our inner Artemis? You know, when we feel the thrill of the hunt, the surge of ambition, uh, the joy of freedom, we are embodying Artemis. You know, when you just wanna get on the road and go on a road trip and you don't have any plans, you got nothing in your car but a but a tent and a cooler and you're just going to see where you end up and you don't tell anybody where you're going and you're not meeting anybody that's that's all artemis energy it's a fascinating quality that we all have uh, what about athena athena is another great goddess of of the ancient greek world her roman name will be minerva so we'll go with athena for now she's the goddess of wisdom and in, in a very clear sense, the, the presiding spirit of the city of Athens. Athens is named after Athena, uh, which, and the Athenians, the home of Socrates and Plato and all of that stuff. She, you know, Greek philosophy, the early experimental democracies of, Para, of Periclean Athens, that's all associated with Athena. And the, the goddess of wisdom and discernment and leadership. She was born right out of the head of Zeus. She does not have a mom. Born out of the head of Zeus. She represents reason and self-governance and problem solving and the powers of persuasion and verbal facility. She is a terrific attorney. You know, think Kamala Harris, maybe. You know, uh, 
I, it's always risky to grab a contemporary figure and associate her, but she's on a lot of our minds these days. And, and you know, uh, a district attorney in San Francisco, and then the attorney general of California, and then a U.S. senator, and 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 maybe on her way to the White House. I don't know. As I'm making this tape, it's uh, before the election, but she certainly uh, has all of those Athenian kind of qualities. Um, competent, hardworking, productive, self-assured, logical, and interested in the common good. Uh, these are all the qualities that we associate with the goddess Athena. But um, to people that don't know her very well, Athena might appear aloof, unaffectionate, cold, um, or self-righteous to those who don't like her or who don't uh, know her very well. So again, where is the Athena inside of us? Well, when we trust ourselves, when we feel confident, and when we calmly solve problems with clarity and insight and with reason and patience, um, we are manifesting Athena. We are embodying Athena. That's a, it's a powerful goddess to tap into when you're having a problem, right? To find your inner Athena, to calm down and just take care of it. Let's look at Demeter. Uh, so Demeter, or Ceres, as she's later known in Roman myth, she's the goddess of harvest and fertility. D Demeter is, is one of the oldest goddesses in the Greek pantheon. She's the classic earth mother, the great mother, the Mahadevi um, in Sanskrit. Her daughter, by the way, is Persephone. We'll get to her in a minute. So Demeter is the goddess of abundance and generosity and nurturing, all the qualities of the earth, all of the qualities of the ripening of the grain. She's the energy of all that grows and the giver of nourishment. She knows our need before we do, and she fulfills that need. So when we nurture, when we cultivate, when we care for and honor all life, we embody Demeter. When we take care of animals, when we take care of the planet, when we take care of our families, we are manifesting that abundant and bottomless well of generative, loving, nurturing energy that is Demeter. Let's talk about Hera, or in later Roman myth, Juno. So, because she's the god, she's the wife of Jupiter, or in the, let's stick with the Greek stuff here, here as the wife of Zeus. Now, Zeus is no angel, right? He's the impossible husband, quite, quite, quite a monster in many respects. So, she is the long suffering wife of uh, Zeus. Um, and, sh but she asserted her own power inside and outside of the relationship very, very much. She's her own woman all the way. But, she is the goddess of partnership and the goddess of marriage. And so she represents something powerful in us too, our ability to sublimate ourselves into a partnership, to be a partner. That's Hera energy, to be devoted, to be supportive, uh, to, to recognize that a union strengthens both partners. And when we sacrifice our own wants, for the betterment of our partnerships, and when we draw satisfaction from the act of helping, then we are embodying Hera. So Hera has a, a, a unique role to play here, not all the, very different than Artemis, right? Who's off on her own, doesn't have a partner, isn't all about that team building stuff. So it's fascinating to me as I just pause for a moment and reflect on when have I recognized those kind of goddess energies in me? Uh, and I know you might find that language strange, but again, I'm trying to gender neutralize all of this. Let's not just leave this for women and men got to be like the gods. I don't think that's how the psychological theory of myth works at all. <laughs> these are human qualities that are embodied in these stories and in these characters. And when we look at these, we, we uh, have an opportunity to learn something about ourselves. So the next one is Hestia or in her Roman name, Vesta. And she's the goddess of hearth and home. Now, you may not know much about her because there's no statues of her, there are no temples of her, but she is the sweet fire of the hearth that burns in all of us, our center, our comfort, our refuge, our self-care. 
And the reason there are no statues and no temples of Hestia is because she lives in the hearth fire in everyone's home. In our modern homes, what we would call the kitchen. You know, she is, which is the heartbeat of the home. Is that's, that's where the fire is. That's where the food gets cooked. Everybody's in the kitchen. And so that's the, that's the purview of Hestia. Um, from her Latin name in Roman mythology, Vesta, that's where the word vest comes from, you know, a vest or a vestment. That's where the word investment comes from. Think about it. Both vest and investment, they're both about protection. They're both about surrounding what you have and keeping it safe. So when we nest and attend to our homes, we are embodying Hestia. Go to Home Depot this weekend, go to Lowe's, go to the Hart Hardware Store. You'll see tons of guys there picking up paint, picking up boards, picking up nails, picking up tools. Guys are always nesting. They're always tinkering with their homes, working on something. Um, there's a certain serenity and peace in that work. It's, it's some primal stuff. And so, trust me, a lot of guys are channeling their inner Hestia all the time when they're doing those those home improvement projects. Yeah, and so are we when we just wash the sheets and vacuum the house and tidy up everything and bring home a bunch of groceries and make a nice meal. All the home stuff. That's that's Hestia's lane. Finally, the last one I want to look at is Persephone. Persephone, and under uh, her Latin name would be would be uh, Proserpine. Proserpine. But let's go with Persephone. Again, the daughter of Demeter, the great mother goddess we talked about a couple minutes ago. Uh, so Persephone is the goddess of death and renewal and transformation. Um, she is in this archetypal mother-daughter relationship with her mother Demeter, who is like the archetypal mother. So she's the archetypal daughter, but she struggles a little bit. Um, and she also personifies spring, and we'll see why in a minute. So the story goes that she was grabbed by Hades and dragged down into the underworld. Hades is the god of the underworld. And so kidnapped by Hades, taken down for a whole, for, for months, right? And her mom Demeter goes looking for her on this epic quest and finally discovers her and rescues her and leads her out of the underworld. Look at the symbolism here of the disappearance into the abyss for a while and then the reemergence. That's why she's the goddess of spring. So when do we embody or personify Persephone? When we grow out of the abyss of addiction, depression, and trauma to reclaim our rightful place in the world by integrating all of the fragmented parts of our scattered psyches into a harmonious whole. When we are made whole, when we attain integration, healing, wellness, wholeness, we come out of the abyss, that is when we embody Persephone. And we have all had our, our abyss moments. We'll hear later when we study Joseph Campbell's Hero with a Thousand Faces that on the hero's journey, going into the abyss, the belly of the whale, as Campbell calls it, is again an integral part of the, of the unraveling that always precedes the reintegration. So Persephone is this beautiful kind of tragic character who nevertheless is reborn. And whenever we are in a dark time, I always think this is the season of Persephone. We are all in the abyss. We are all scattered, fragmented, wounded, and in the dark, confused, and we can't find the path. But that beautiful pedagogical piece, that Demeter, the cosmic generative energy of the, co of, of the universe itself, right? The Earth Mother Goddess is always 
always longing for our reunion, always looking for us. And just as, sh just as sure as dark as the darkness of winter comes, the dawning of spring will follow. You can count on that. And so these myths hold for us these universal archetypal truths. And in that way, these stories of the goddess are not just quaint stories about ancient fictional characters. They may just be profoundly, powerfully useful psychological tools to help us unpack the fragmentation, bring it out into the light of day, and reintegrate, and reintegrate ourselves into a whole. That's what we long for. And maybe myth can play an enormously significant role in that process if we let it. See you on the other side.